Hey guys, and welcome to the fifth video in this multi-part series on how to study words for tournament Scrabble. In this video, we'll be taking our first dive into studying bingos. Now, as a reminder for folks who may not be as familiar with some of the terminology used in tournament Scrabble, a bingo is when you play all seven tiles from your rack at the same time, and that earns you a 50 point bonus for that turn. So if you can start bingoing more often, you'll rise in your average score, and along with that, a rise in the number of Scrabble games that you're winning. So even if you can just learn a small number of bingos, if those are useful bingos that come up frequently, then that'll pretty quickly give you a leg up on some of your other competition. So with that in mind, in this video, we'll be focusing on just some of the most useful bingos, and in particular, the most probable bingos. We talked a little bit about probability in one of the earlier videos, and we'll be revisiting that concept in detail today. I also included a bonus row here, as you can see, on the five vowel sevens and eights. There's only about 400 of these words, so it's not a particularly lengthy list, but it's one I studied very early on when I was starting Tournament Scrabble, and I found it to be extremely useful and a list that was often overlooked. So I think it'll be a useful and fun addition once you start your journey into bingo study. And without further ado, let's jump right in. We had the same slide on probability in one of the earlier videos, but I just want to revisit it here before we dive into the details of bingo study. So as a reminder, probability has to do with the likelihood that you're going to draw a given word out of a full bag of Scrabble tiles. Of course, a bag of Scrabble tiles has a predetermined distribution. Certain letters like the E, the A, the I, the N, the R, the T occur quite often, whereas certain letters like the Q and the Z occur quite rarely. So of course, words like sardine that have a lot of the more frequently occurring letters, uh, sardine in particular doesn't have any letters that are more rare than four times occurring in the bag, the S and the D. The A and the I occur nine times, the R and the N occur six times, and the E occurs 12 times. So all the letters in sardine occur with pretty high frequency in the bag, and it's approximately the hundredth most likely seven out of about 25,000. Something like jukebox, as we discussed in the Earlier video would be very unlikely to occur because it requires a J, a K, and an X all to be on your rack, and each of those respectively only occurs once in the bag. So the probability of having all three of those at the same time, along of course with the B, which only occurs twice, is very, very slim. Something like teacups would be in the middle of these because it doesn't have any of the really rare letters like the J and the X, but the C and the P each only occur twice, so it makes it considerably more rare than something like sardine, where all the letters occur four or more times. So this pretty much uh, covers the concept of probability. Basically, when you study, the key is to use the concept of probability to judge which words are going to be more useful. You want to start your bingo study with the most probable words, and only once you have a pretty solid grasp on those should you start moving on to lower probability words. In general, if you have a word that's more probable, it's going to come up more often in games, and therefore it's a word that's more valuable to know for tournament scrabble purposes. You'll actually be able to get to play it more often and use it in a game than you would a word that is much less probable. For instance, I've probably played the word sardine, I don't even know, dozens and dozens of times in tournaments, or if, especially if you count variants like sardines and sardines, many, many times. I don't believe I've ever played the word jukebox before. Uh, maybe once, and almost certainly with a blank and not as a bingo. So. Uh, the probability concept really does work, I can assure you that. The high probability words come up all the time, um, and like multiple times a, a tournament you'll see sometimes even the same word across the same division getting played many, many times. And the low probability words, it's really fun to play them when you do get them, but uh, rest assured they do not come up often. So if you can just master the high probability words, that'll really, really send your ability and rating skyrocketing. So with that in mind, now let's discuss how we use this concept in practice to maximize the efficiency of our bingo study. Now on this slide here, I have uh, the specific technique I actually used when I was studying bingos basically all the way through from the beginning before I'd studied a single bingo all the way to the end when I finished out all of the seven and eight letter words. I guess it's worth mentioning too when I say bingos, I'm talking about seven and eight letter words. You can theoretically bingo with a longer word than that, like a nine or even a 10, if you play through multiple tiles on the board, but uh, that's very rare comparatively for, for that to happen. Uh, I don't recommend studying nine letter words. I've personally never even studied any 10 letter words, and uh, I have studied a bunch of nine letter words, but I didn't do that until I had studied all of the seven and eight letter words. So I won't really be discussing nine letter words in this series since uh, only the most advanced players typically uh, do get to the point of studying those. So when I say bingos, to be very clear, I mean seven and eight letter words. Eight letter words are extremely important because you're very often 
could have seven tiles on your rack and want to play through a single tile already on the board. So I actually play, I think, if anything, more eight letter words than seven letter words, since it's often easier to play through a tile on the board than it is to fit a seven letter word, especially if the seven letter word you're playing has a lot of tiles like C's and V's that don't make many two letter words, if any, it can be hard to find a spot for it to play on the board as a standalone hooking other tiles. So it's very important to know both seven and eight letter words, and uh, that's a very important point. And throughout uh, this video, as well as later videos, uh, you'll see I'll be advising that folks study the sevens and the eights in parallel. So basically, at any given point, you should have uh, not really any deeper knowledge in the sevens or the or the eights or vice versa. You should be studying them pretty much at the same rate. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, that's just an important point uh, point to make, and we will be revisiting that uh, in detail as we continue to go along. But basically, for for this slide, this is the technique that I use. So I tend to break up my bingo studying sessions into groups of 200 words, uh, no more and no less. Uh, no more, especially uh, because I find that trying to study more words than this, if, especially if these are new words I don't know before, it's just too much for your brain to take in at the same time. And uh, it just ends up not being productive and you don't end up absorbing the words as well. If you try this and find that 200 at once is too much for you, it can very easily be scaled down to 100 words or even 50 words. But basically, if we use the 200 number, this is what I do. I split the group of 200 into two smaller groups of 100. So let's say I'm studying my first 200 bingos ever. The probability 1 through probability 200 sevens, we'll say. You'd use the same process for the eights. So my first group would be probability 1 through 100 sevens, and my second group would be probability 100 through 200 sevens. I'm going to take my first group, which is probability 1 through 100, and do a very similar process that we've been discussing for some of the other word lists. I'm going to start by searching in Ziziva or Aerolith. Uh, probably Ziziva would be slightly preferable for the first time. Searching for the entire word list and then taking a read through the word list, sort of casually noting down a bunch of the words that seem unfamiliar. Once I've read through that word list, I'm going to create a quiz and quiz myself on that list. Then I'm going to uh, go through the missed quiz, which I'm uh, basically using here as a term for a quiz on all of the words that I've missed. And when I say iterate, I just mean go through the missed quiz uh, over and over until you've gotten all the words once. So for instance, I go through the 100 words, I miss 20. I'm going to do a quiz on those 20 words. If I then miss again five words out of those 20, I'm going to do another quiz on those five words and so on and so forth until I get all the words at least once. Then once I've done that, I'm going to repeat the same quiz on all 100 words from scratch. And hopefully at that point, I'll miss uh, very few, if any, words. But if I do miss any words, then I'll do the same process of iterating through that missed quiz. So you'll be quizzing yourself on the same 100 words, uh, all, the entire group, twice. And then at that point, you're going to do the same exact thing for the next 100 words. You're going to create a search, read through the list, and then do this iterative quizzing process so you'll actually be quizzing yourself on both sets of 100 words individually twice. And then once you're done with all that, you're going to do one larger quiz, as you can see on the right here, on all 200 words. So you'll do uh, two separate quizzes of 100 words each. That's 400 words, sort of, you're seeing. And then you'll do yet another quiz of 200 words. So you're actually seeing 600 words. So it is quite a, uh, it is a bit of a time-consuming process. Uh, you'll end up seeing all of the words in this group of 200 words uh, three different times. And then uh, once you go through this final quiz of all 200 words, at this point, you've already seen all of the words, <clears throat> excuse me, you've already seen all of the words twice. So hopefully by then you'll be pretty familiar with them and you'll have a small number of missed words, but any missed words that you have at that point, you should definitely make sure to iterate through those uh, carefully on a missed quiz so that you are fairly familiar with them. Uh, and yeah, so it is, like I said, fairly time consuming since even though you're learning 200 words, you're actually going to be quizzing yourself on 600 words or really more than 600 because you're going to have missed quizzes too. So it may end up being more like seven or 800 words. Uh, so it is a lot, but I assure you that this technique works extremely well. You'll end up seeing all of these words, not once, not twice, but three times. And it's, uh, this is pretty much the most efficient way to, to do that while also sort of uh, forcing your brain to meld different groups of words together. That's why I like splitting it up into two different groups as opposed to doing one larger group. Uh, it's easier to learn the words in slightly smaller groups, but it's important to also train your brain, right? Because when you have a rack in front of you at a tournament, the word isn't in any group, right? You just have the rack and you have to figure out if there's a word in there and it could be any probability seven. So ultimately you need to be able to 
anagram that word regardless of what specific group it's in. So being able to train your brain to know the word from a larger group as opposed to a smaller group I find is really important. So that's why I recommend breaking it up and then doing a larger quiz with 200 words. Um, if you find that this is too much for you at one sitting, then as I mentioned, it can be scaled down. If you want to do 100 words at the same time, just basically divide everything here by two. So split it up into two groups of 50 words, do the same process on each group of 50 words, and then when you do that, or when you finished with that, then quiz yourself on all 100 words collectively. But basically, the key takeaway here with this process is you should be individually quizzing yourself twice uh, on each of the subgroups, and then once you've gone through those, then you should quiz yourself once on the whole group. So you'll be saying every word three times, uh, twice in the con context of a smaller group and once in the context of a larger group. And uh, and yeah, this is pretty much the technique that, like I said, I used for all the sevens, all the eights, uh, as well as some of the nines that I've studied, basically going all the way from the beginning, all the way uh, to the very end of when I was studying bingos. And uh, I have to say it worked super, super well. Uh, my recall has been outstanding through, throughout my Scrabble career. I haven't really even been uh, been reviewing that much, but I went through this process uh, multiple times for all the sevens and the eights, and I'm continuing to recall them really well. So it's uh, it's worked quite well for me, and all all the words by going through this process have have stuck quite well. So I highly recommend that folks uh, again, both new to tournament Scrabble as well as more experienced who are looking to study more low probability bingos. Uh, this one slide here, the technique, can work for really any set any set of bingos. Um, so yeah, really, really, really useful and, uh, and very important. So with that in mind, I'm going to now uh, quickly show you how to do this in practice in Ziziva. So let's say I'm starting from the very beginning and I want to study the first 207 letter words by probability. What I'm going to do is create a new search and type in a length condition for seven letters long. And then, as I mentioned, I'm going to be splitting that group of 200 words into two smaller groups of 100 words. So I want my probability filter to go from 1 to 100 to start, not 1 to 200. Now, it's important over here to select two blanks, since there are two blanks in the Scrabble bag. So using zero blanks will uh, slightly affect the algorithm. It's more important as you get into the lower probability words, but it's important uh, mostly just to be consistent, because if you change between zero and two blanks throughout your studies, you may inadvertently skip over some words as you're going through, which you definitely don't want to do. And you always want to uncheck this lax box. I'm not exactly sure what it does, but it always seems to add extra words to your range, which you're going to end up studying anyway. So it's just going to create extra work and confusion. So of course, if I hit search, I'm going to get 100 words, as we can see in the bottom left. And what you're going to do is click this column to sort them by probability. Now, as we've done for some of the other word lists that we've studied, we're going to read through the list uh, at least once, just to at least somewhat familiarize ourselves with all the different words here. Uh, you'll see some are fairly obscure, like aneroid or anestri, but you also do have plenty of common words like trained and toenail. And once I've read through the list, I'm going to do a right click and hit quiz from list. And basically, like we've seen for the other word lengths, just go through the same process of quizzing myself on all of these words. So this one is going to be goatier. Now, with the longer words, it definitely does get a little bit tiring typing them out. So what you can do if you want to go faster is hit flashcard mode. And then if I just hit the space bar, it'll show me all of the answers. Uh, so this one is going to be sardine, which is the word we talked about on one of the previous slides, as well as its two anagrams, sandier and randy. So you can see the total number of words on the bottom left, which is uh, the second number in this correct section over here. So zero for three means there are going to be three total words. Now, just be careful when you're using flashcard mode when there are multiple words like this to look through and make sure you did actually get this correct. It's easy when you kind of get in the role to be going fast and accidentally skip over something you got wrong. So uh, definitely use flashcard mode. It'll save you a lot of time, but use it with caution. Make sure you're actually looking at the word or words and uh, confirming you actually got it right. If you're using flashcard mode and you see you got it wrong, you're going to uh, either just hit the M on your keyboard, I find that's easiest, or hit this mark is missed icon to make sure that it gets added to your missed list. Uh, and then basically so on and so, and so forth. You're going to go through this entire list, and then when you're done, hit Analyze Quiz, and then do a quiz from uh, all of these missed words over here. And as I mentioned, just keep iterating through this process. Continue to quiz yourself on all of the missed words until you've gotten them at least once. Uh, and then if you recall from the table that we talked about earlier in the presentation, the next step is going to be repeating the same quiz of 100 words from the very beginning. 
So the easiest way to do that is just to go back to your search once you've done the quiz once and the set of missed words, and you're literally going to just repeat the same process. Hit quiz from list and do the same thing all over again. And once you've done that twice, then we're going to go back to our search pane over here and do the exact same thing for probability order 100 to 200. So I won't go through the whole process here, but, uh, but yeah, once again, I'm just going to sort these by probability order, read them, and then go through my two iterations of quizzes. And finally, once I'm done with that, then I'm going to expand the search to the full range of 200 words, like such. And uh, at this point, I've been through all the words twice, so I don't need to reread them or anything. I should be fairly familiar. And I'm going to now create a full-size 200-word quiz from this list. Uh, this, uh, this doesn't actually matter here since I'm starting from the beginning. And hit OK, and then go through this list in the same fashion. And once again, after I'm done, hopefully at this point I have very few of any missed words since I'll have already seen all of the individual words twice. But if I have any missed words, of course I'll want to make sure to go through them and make sure I have them down fairly solidly before I complete my study session. So that's basically how one study session would work. Once again, if you don't want to do 200 words at once, if you find that's too much and you want to do 100, just do the same thing. But for the individual searches, you would do 1 to 50 and 50 to 100 instead of 1 to 100 and 100 to 200. If you feel like scaling it back even further to 50 words, then you could even just do it with 1 to 25 and 25 to 50. This can really be used with any number of words. You could do 88 words at one sitting if you wanted. Basically, just divide that number by 2 and split it up into two sections. I generally don't recommend studying more than 200 words at one sitting, especially with bingos. Uh, I, I found I would see a significant decrease in, uh, in retention if I did that, but uh, you might find for yourself that you have uh, capacity to study more than that, and, uh, and that's totally fine. If you if you feel like it, you can definitely do this process twice and study 400 words at once. You may also find that uh, your attention drops off uh, well lower than 200 words. And in that case, uh, like I mentioned, I would recommend uh, just doing the same process, but scaling it down to 100 words or something like that, uh, or whatever you feel is appropriate, and doing two groups of 50 words uh, one after the other. But yeah, that's basically, in a nutshell, how I would study these words. I do find Ziziva to be a little bit more of an effective tool for, for going through bingos for the first time than, than Aerolith, uh, but especially for the uh, the quiz of 200 words, if you want to do that on Aerolith, then uh, you very much can do that as well. So if I wanted to create a similar list on Aerolith, I'm going to just go to this word search, and I would uh, add a word length criterion and the probability range. So once again, uh, I'm going to have here 1 to 200. This is assuming I'm doing my final uh, review quiz of all 200 words on Aerolith. Uh, I don't recommend doing one of the initial quizzes on the subsets of 100 words on Aerolith. I personally have always found that it's easier to at first learn them on Ziziva uh, when you can kind of go through them in, in flashcard mode rather than having to look at them on a, on a screen and, uh, and jumble all of them at the same time. I find that to be a little bit overwhelming for words you're really just learning. But if at this point you feel like you know them pretty well and you want to do the review quiz of all 200 words on Aerolith, then uh, by all means uh, go ahead. I never really did this uh, all that much, but it's uh, very much a viable way to, to do it if you prefer mixing it up a little bit and not just uh, using Ziziva the whole time. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much uh, bingo study in, in a nutshell. So if I want to do um, the first thousand seven letter words and eight letter words, which is uh, what I had on my uh, table. So once again, if we go back here, we see the first row that we're talking about in this video is the top 1000 probability sevens and eights. If I want to do that, I'm going to just take it 200 at a time like this. So I'll do 1 to 200, and then 200 to 400, 400 to 600, 600 to 800, and finally 800 to 1,000 in separate study sessions. And I'm going to do that for the 7s, and then I'm going to do the same exact thing for the 8s. Uh, you can either do 200 7s and 200 8s and 200 7s and 200 8s and so forth, or it's fine if you want to just do 1,000 th 7s and then 1,000 8s. I think that's maybe a little bit easier. Uh, when I said earlier you want to sort of keep it even between 7s and 8s, that doesn't mean you need to be super specific, like every 100 words, oh, you have to study 100 8s after doing 100 7s. It doesn't have to be that precise. But generally within the same 1,000, I feel, is good, especially when you're starting out. Like, don't study 6,000 7s and only study a couple 100 8s. Like, study 1,000 7s or so, and then at that point, once you feel good about those, catch up on the 8s, do 1,000 8s before you go forward. And I think uh, the top 1,000 of each is a very good place to start when you're studying bingos uh, before you move on to the next set of words. As you can see here, the, uh, the, four, the rest of the 4s and the useful 5s, which we'll be talking about in the next video before diving deeper into the bingos. 
Uh, but before we close out for this video, I do want to briefly mention the five vowel sevens and eights. So as I discussed earlier, it's a fairly short list, about 400 words, but it is super, super useful because they can often make the difference between a, a truly ugly rack with five vowels, even six vowels in some cases, where you're maybe even thinking about an exchange and, uh, and out of nowhere you pull out a bingo. So I have a few examples of some fun five vowel sevens and eights on this slide over here. Uh, these are just a couple of my favorite ones. Let me move the webcam briefly so you guys can see. So Arapaima, A-R-A-P-A-I-M-A, -A -A, which actually has four A's in it, is a, uh, a very cool and uh, large kind of fish, which I believe is native to South America, though somebody uh, may correct me on that if I am mistaken. But in any case, this is an Arapaima. Uh, Awastidi is a very uh, cute little uh, monkey over here, which we see on the bottom left. This is always a fun one to play. It has three I's and O and a U. So this is a type of rack where it's basically like uh, very often you're either playing Awastidi or you're probably exchanging tiles. There's been many times I've had like a O-U-I-T-I-T-I -I -I on my rack and just like, please give me an S. Uh, and it's super satisfying when they give you an S because if you've got three I's, two T's and O and a U, you're probably playing something like Tui for 12 or exchanging if you don't have Awastidi. Uh, and then another fun one is Aigil, A-I-G-U-I-L-L-E. I may be botching the pronunciation on that. Somebody who is more fluent in French uh, should correct me if I'm wrong, but it is a type of mountain peak, which I have pictured here. So these are just a couple of the fun 5L8s. Uh, there's many, many more that are really useful. And uh, again, the reason they're really useful is because uh, it's sort of like a, a bingo or die kind of rack, right? By definition, if you have five vowels, you really don't have a good rack. So uh, if you know these bingos, it can really, really help you make lemonade out of lemons. And uh, it's sometimes an overlooked list too. A lot of newer players uh, focus too much on probability and don't necessarily uh, think about this list. So it can really give you an edge uh, over some of your competition at this point. So let me just quickly show you how you would create this search in Ziziva. So what I'm going to do is do uh, length. I would probably recommend doing the sevens and then the eights or, or vice versa. In general, it can just be a little bit confusing studying seven and eight letter words at the same time. You'll find that there are a lot more eights than sevens with five vowels. So the sevens should go by pretty quickly. Uh, but basically the way you search for this is using the number of vowels condition and then just change the minimum to five. So you'll see with sevens, there's actually only 39 words. So the vast majority of these are going to be eights, which isn't surprising because five vowels is a much larger percentage of seven than it is of eight. It's a lot harder to have five vowels and only two consonants as opposed to five vowels with three consonants. So this is the entire list here. Basically, uh, a lot of these, if not most of these, are obscure. Like uh, in terms of common words, um, I mean, maybe alieni is somewhat common. Aquaria is a little bit of a strange plural of aquarium, but there are a couple somewhat common words here. Aureal maybe. Uh, but most of these you'll find will be obscure. So these are words that you'll mostly, uh, I guess Sequoia is one other common one, but uh, these are words that you'll mostly just know through your Scrabble studies, which I think is pretty cool and makes it a particularly fun list. And what you're going to do is, uh, as we've done for similar lists, just kind of read through this list, uh, get yourself as familiar as you can, and then create a quiz by right-clicking and, uh, and go through this list in quiz format a couple times. Uh, and then you're going to do the same thing for the eights. We'll see that the eights are a little bit longer of a list. There's 340 of these. So these may uh, take you a little bit longer. If you want to split it up, uh, that's totally reasonable. Uh, with these, you're going to be going through the whole list uh, fairly quickly. So it doesn't really matter how you split them up. If you want to split them up alphabetically, that's totally fine. If you want to do it by probability too, that's totally fine. You'll see some of these uh, will overlap with your study of the first thousand. Uh, in fact, a lot of these actually are in the top thousand probability eights, which isn't particularly shocking because the uh, A's, E's, I's, O's, and uh, mostly those, but the U's a little bit too, are fairly high probability. Uh, so you'll see quite a lot of them are in the top thousand. So all the way up through Emerite uh, before Aurori, and you should already be familiar with these words from your uh, top thousand probability bingo study. Uh, and then the rest, like I said, you can uh, split it up into, into chunks if you if you want, um, or uh, or just if you feel comfortable, read through the, the whole list and uh, and keep quizzing yourself on it over and over, pretty much until you've gotten them uh, them all correct. Um, but but yeah, I mean, I don't think uh, it's not necessary to have these like super solid or, or anything that early, since uh, ultimately you will be seeing more and more of these right as you go through your your bingos. I, I certainly don't expect folks uh, who are just starting and have only learned the 
top thousand sevens and eights to all of a sudden uh, have all the the five L seven and eight letter words down super solid right after that. I don't I don't think that's uh, necessary, and I wouldn't spend like too much time on these, but uh, I I do think it's a, it's a really kind of fun and useful diversion. Um, normally, I think it's good to stick to the same structure with probability, and uh, I definitely would do the first thousand by probability first, just to kind of get your feet wet with with bingo study. Uh, but once you're comfortable with that and kind of understand the, the process of bingo study, I think taking a little uh, side detour to kind of celebrate you're finishing the first thousand uh, and doing these, which uh, are really cool. It's always really fun to play these. You know, you have a rack like A-A-E-I-O-U-B or something where you think, oh, I'm going to probably have to exchange. And your opponent puts a D in the middle of the double-double lane, and instead of exchanging, lo and behold, you're playing Aboy Do for 94 points and feeling really, really good about yourself. So, uh, so yeah, I think uh, I think it's a really fun list. Definitely recommend it. And uh, and yeah, that's pretty much it for for this video. So I hope you guys uh, enjoyed this video. Once again, that took us through the top thousand probability uh, sevens and eights, as well as the five L sevens and eights. And I'm just gonna pull up that bingo study flowchart one more time, so that you guys can uh, note it or, uh, or reference it for future videos. So one second. Uh, so yeah, here once again is the. Structure I recommend for studying bingos, uh, and uh, as a refactor, it involves splitting up a group of 200 or however many you want to study at once into two subgroups and then quizzing yourself a couple times on each of those subgroups until you feel like you have those uh, pretty well down, and then finally quizzing yourself on the whole list. And once again, the way, uh, the, the reason I like to do it this way is so that you see all the words not once, not twice, but three times, and also have practice uh, seeing them in a smaller group where it's easier to learn them at, at first, as well as a larger group where it might be a little bit harder to recall them and it'll be a little bit more reflective of actual gameplay when you really aren't being told that your word is in any particular list. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much it, guys. I, uh, I know this was a little bit of a longer video, but I think it's uh, really, really important since this is basically going to carry us through all of uh, the remainder of Bingo Study. We've seen pretty much everything we need at this point uh, mechanically to, to study the, the rest of the word, so I think it's a really important video and I hope you guys enjoyed it and, uh, and found it useful. So yeah, especially if you start using this technique for studying bingos, let me know what you think. I, uh, I, I feel like it's, uh, it's really good. It's worked great for, for me and uh, I hope it does for you as well. But if you find something better, then uh, I'm all ears and by all means, let me know. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks again for watching guys and I will see you soon for the next video in the series. Have a good one. Bye-bye.